Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to the final installment in our Founding Your Family's Paper Trail virtual talk series. This uh, three-part series is hosted by the Chinese Canadian Museum and funded by the Government of Canada. My name is Rosalie Gunawan and I'm the Education and Public Programs Coordinator at the Chinese Canadian Museum. So I would like to begin by acknowledging that the Chinese Canadian Museum is located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples in what is now Vancouver Chinatown. We value the interconnected and ongoing histories of Indigenous peoples and Chinese Canadians and strive to reflect on and share these diverse stories in our exhibitions and programs. So today's lecture, Preserving Your Family's Paper Trail, is presented by June Chow. June is a professionally trained archivist, archival scholar, and award-winning heritage worker with expertise in the preservation and management of Chinese Canadian documentary heritage. In Vancouver, she is archivist with the paper trail to the 1923 Chinese Exclusion Act, ensuring preservation and access to Chinese immigration records in equitable partnership with public institutions. She currently works at Toronto Public Library with its Chinese Canadian archive and local communities to safeguard their recorded histories in the city. June identifies as a second generation Cantonese speaking Chinese Canadian of Hoi Ping heritage. Welcome June. Our other panelists joining us today are Catherine Clement, curator and creator of the paper trail to the 1923 Chinese Exclusion Act, our future exhibition at the Chinese Canadian Museum in Vancouver Chinatown and Naomi Louie, curator curatorial assistant on the Paper Trail project and current museum assistant at the Chinese Canadian Museum. She will, um, both Catherine and Naomi will be helping with the questions posed in this webinar's Q&A today, as will I. So June will begin with a 60 minute presentation and then we will dedicate the remaining time until 11.30 to answering questions from the audience. So please feel to feel free to ask any remaining questions, ask any questions you have in the Q&A, and we will select from some of those to ask June in real time. So just to remind everyone, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on the Chinese Canadian Museum's website and YouTube channel um, by the end of the week, likely by Wednesday though. And so with that, I will now turn things over to June. Thank you so much for being here with us today, June. Hi, thank you so much. Um, it's great to be here and thank you for being here everyone as uh, on your spring breaks, I think. Um, I'm joining in from the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Wendat and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, also known as Toronto. Um, and uh, I wanna thank the Chinese Canadian Museum for organizing this series. Um, the first two talks by Linda and Catherine were devoted to finding your family's paper trail. And so today I'll talk about um, preserving what you found. Um, there we go. Is the screen sharing now? <laughs> um, Today I'll cover how to preserve, uh, which uh, involves some of the technical aspects, and then uh, save time for why we preserve and the heritage intention around that. And examples that I show will be from the Paper Trail Collection and also the Toronto Public Library's Chinese Canadian Archive, where uh, I'm currently working. So first, what is preservation? Uh, preservation involves extending the life of an object by protecting it against deterioration, damage, or loss. It takes a preventative approach, assuming objects are in good, stable condition, and uses DIY or do-it-yourself techniques and common sense. So um, it sounds a lot like do this, don't do that, which is very Asian mom. Um, and it differs from uh, conservation, which involves specialized treatments and techniques to repair damage that has been done. And uh, because it's the paper trail, we're focusing on paper-based materials. So CI certificates and other kind of legal documents um, 
photographs, which are on paper and very common in family uh, archives, and then digitized items that were once paper. So preservation actions are what differentiate records from archives. A record is information affixed to a medium. Uh, we create records in the natural course of our day as a, re as a record of what we did that day. To, so to preserve a record simply means to keep it for some time, uh, to not throw it away, to set it aside for future use. Um, and this potential usefulness in the future imparts real or perceived value, which can be subjective, right? One man's trash is another man's treasure. So um, sometimes, or actually often, archives is a loaded term because of this value judgment. And um, uh, I prefer sometimes to use, in certain contexts, to use more ne neutral terminology, such as uh, record, object, and item. And um, a little bit of a caution when using archive as a verb, when uh, the word preserve might suffice. Uh, because archival preservation, archival preservation is um, defined as long-term preservation or permanent preservation. Uh, it involves standards, guidelines, and best practices established and accepted across museum, archives, and other heritage professions. And so there's a little bit of warning and also an apology that um, these standards can be very overwhelming because they can get very technical. They, they actually are very technical. They are based on minimums. And there we know that there's always more that can be done if you have the resources. And they're highly variable and meant to be adapted. So the challenge for um, individuals is how to adapt standards for your personal use. Uh, preservation consists of two parts. It, there's the uh, preservation of the physical item. And then there's preservation of the intellectual understanding or context of the item. So I'll start with um, physical preservation. Paper, if properly preserved, is actually a very stable format. CI certificates are made on um, high quality bond paper. They're built to last and the black and white photographs uh, are resistant against um, fading. As records, they were actively used as proof of identity. And so we see common preservation issues resulting from this uh, so-called wear and tear. So you can see in this certificate, the uh, physical force forces of folding that have created creases and uh, where creases have um, uh, put the risk of tearing uh, where tape has been used and uh, create left some residue and also cause some uh, discoloration, and that's from the chemicals that are in the tape. But this uh, certificate um, has survived, this record has survived, and uh, has been passed down in the family, and so now we, uh, for long-term preservation, we put on our Asian mom, you know, hat on, and we say uh, how to store it, is um, we store things flat. Uh, don't store it folded, because every time you fold it and unfold it, those are uh, physical forces. And if it happens that your document is uh, very brittle and might like, you know, snap or something, uh, that's the time to bring it to a conservator to try to rehydrate it, similar to what you would do with leather when it becomes um, uh, dried out. Um, we store things flat in acid-free file folders. And that means, um, but you can also, uh, the next step up would be a plastic sleeve. And some people um, prefer this uh, so that things remain visible and that uh, sleeves actually accommodate one, usually just one item per sleeve. So um, when we, we see a lot of bad plastics in the archives that have made their way there. Um, and that's because of uh, PVC and vinyl is um, very prevalent. And those disintegrate, uh, become discolor discolored, and then they damage uh, whatever uh, your documents. What we want to look for is the good plastics, which is um, are made out of polyester film. And these are inert and chemically safe uh, and stable, so they will not do any damage. Um, something that... Uh, we look out for is also the type of openings or access. Um, to sleeves. Uh, the common kind of page protector that you would see is a U pocket. 
uh, sorry, a U shape or a pocket uh, type of uh, enclosure where there is the just the single opening along one of the short sides from the top. And those are actually tricky to get things uh, in and out of, right? Um, what we prefer in the archives is the use of an L sleeve, like the capital letter L, because it represents the two side, it's only bonded on two sides. And so this is a little bit easier to get in and out of, and also to really uh, tuck uh, your document into that, into that corner for safety. Um, this certificate uh, that you see would, um, I would actually go one step further. So um, putting it into a sleeve, but also we would uh, think of doing an, a, a, a technique called encapsulation. So here's an example of that. And encapsulation involves uh, basically uh, creating an uh, kind of like a, you're kind of trapping it inside the plastic sleeve and sealing it along all four sides. Um, this is not lamination, which involves high heat to melt plastic and is considered non-reversible. In uh, preservation and conservation techniques, we're always looking for techniques that could be that are reversible and leave uh, no trace of damage. Um, so these are two ways that uh, that encapsulation has been done. On the left, uh, it was actually done by a conservator using a special kind of um, kind of soldering sol soldering kind of pen shaped with a tip so it makes like a clean seam along that top edge. Um, on the orange certificate, it's actually a, a more DIY uh, method using double-sided tape. Uh, and you notice on the orange certificate, there was also tape used on the certificate and uh, has uh, also resulted in tape discoloration, discoloration from the chemicals in the tape. Basically, all adhesives are bad, any tapes or glues. There is no such thing as archival safe uh, adhesives. Um, it's kind of like there's no such thing as flushable wipes, for example, um, because of the chemicals. And uh, what we're trying to do when we put things into uh, file folders or a sleeve or we encapsulate is that we're trying to isolate pollutants. Uh, we're creating uh, these as micro environments that either keep um, pollutants inside so if there is tape or glue on your document, you don't want them uh, to affect, to uh, spread and affect uh, adjacent materials. So you would trap it, you would encapsulate it uh, or otherwise um, isolate it in a micro environment so it doesn't uh, uh, affect others. Um, and this is very true. You have to watch out for um, newspaper clippings because they're usually within uh, paper records, found within paper records. And these are on uh, pulp newsprint paper is very inexpensive and has uh, are very um, have a lot of chemicals. And so they will brown and anything that it's touching will stain. And um, newspaper is uh, such bad quality as well that uh, it will also start to disintegrate uh, faster. It has a shorter lifespan than regular paper. So um, what you would do is you take, remove news, newspaper and put it into a folder, at least you separate it from your um, other documents or you put it in a sleeve or um, you photocopy it because um, to put it on better better quality paper. Other things we do not like are rubber bands. We don't like metal paper clips or staples because those uh, are corrosive and will um, rust. But this um, encapsulation example with the orange certificate uh, does use double-sided tape. So you can use tape safely as long as it doesn't touch your document directly. And so here is a very well-preserved um, photo album from the 1920s and 30s uh, that uses these photo corners. And so it's very, um, it's a good quality uh, paper from the scrapbook. 
And then the use of uh, mounting the photos uh, has been uh, through these photo corners that only have the adhesive on the back. And so um, I took out one of the photos, not because it's missing, but because to show you how cleanly uh, one can do so. And uh, the tape is only, you know, nothing has affected, there's, there's no risk to the photograph. And in fact, you can access the back of the photograph to see if anything has uh, by chance been written. And I mentioned this technique of the corners because um, we like to display or, you know, we have a tendency, like there's a lot of questions coming up about how do I display things safely? And um, so using this corner technique and also because there are um, the, we probably are very familiar with the sticky albums that are out there, that are still out there. They have not become obsolete, but they're those um, sticky, uh, self-magnetic, self-adhesive that uh, that um, do discolor and uh, the adhesive does leave a residue and um, uh, a, a lot of uh, not good things come out of that use of those. So um, please stop, please don't use them. Um, this is uh, just a simple, again, DIY. It doesn't mean that you have to go out and buy a box of those old timey photo corners. Um, you can make it yourself. You can use an old envelope and uh, square off the corner and uh, tuck your photograph inside and the tape goes across the corner. And, um, and uh, you know, uh, your, your document is, is safe within that. The biggest environment to consider though is temperature including um, associated with sunlight uh, because it's really temperature fluctuations that are quite um, damaging. So you have to think about where in your house now do I place, uh, do I um, store my store my photos, store my family papers. Um, humidity has, um, is relative humidity and dampness uh, have a risk of mold, which is very hard to reverse if not impossible. Um, and so basements are bad, um, and anything on the floor should not be, uh, in the event of standing water, you want to have things off the floor at least six inches. So here is a example of a record also from the paper trail, um, that we would want to use digitization on as a preservation strategy to minimize any further handling of the original record because it is so fragile. But note that it's fragile, but not actively deteriorating. Um, we also use digitization to preserve records that are considered um, actively deteriorating because they're reaching the end of their life, reaching the end of life of their media type. So the newsprint that I mentioned, or um, for example, VHS tapes. Um, if items are valuable and irreplaceable, if lost or damaged, those CI certificates within families definitely fall into this category. And if they're difficult to retrieve, and uh, with CI certificates that have um, traveled down a few generations in the family tree, it's actually quite sometimes challenging to locate who, who is in possession of the item. Uh, and then conversely, if an item is is something that is often retrieved and you, and for convenience sake, you would want to digitize so that um, it's uh, accessible. So in digitization for preservation, uh, items are scanned at specifications that allow for a reproduction to be made that can stand in for the original if needed, uh, for example, by printing. So maximum authenticity is the goal, and there is no color correction or other manipulation done on this uh, file. Digitization for preservation is done at high resolution, results in TIFF files, and creates very big files that are stored for posterity as master files from which um, theoretically all other copies are derived. Um, digitization is also done for the purpose of access, uh, for sharing, or for quick reference, as, as mentioned. And in these cases, digitization is done at lower resolutions, sufficient for screen viewing. It results in JPEG files and creates uh, smaller, more manageable files for easy access. So these things and uh, other settings on your scanner is what make up uh, scanning 
make up scanning specifications or scanning specs. And these are, again, highly variable and dependent on many factors, which are specified in elaborate, detailed tables of guidelines. Um, and that'll be some uh, examples will be provided in the resource sheet. So, but for example, um, for the paper trail, when Catherine, Catherine's an exhibition designer. So in the first round of scanning, she knew that she wanted to, um, uh, that she would be using images of certificates in an exhibition setting, blowing them up for very large printing and would need them. Um, so we had very, our scanning specs at that point were very high. Uh, we've since scaled them down because uh, subsequent certificates are going directly into the archive, the digital archive at UBC. Uh, your family photographs, you might be in possession of family photographs that are, you know, from the old world and they're uh, postage size, uh, postage stamp size. And so you would also need to scan these at higher resolutions because it's understood that you'll want to enlarge it uh, either on screen or on screen and or at uh, through printing so that you could see some of that detail. Um, I'm going to mention a great resource. Um, I'll, I'll um, provide links to kind of printed and online standards and guidelines, um, which are all adapted, for, adapted from one another. But um, a great resource is to see about um, your local makerspace and what uh, scanning equipment and scanning and uh, scanning software and hardware are available there as well as good advice. Um, I work at the Toronto Public Library that has digital innovation hubs, and um, and I actually use it uh, as part of my work as well. And so the Vancouver Public Library has an inspiration lab. So those are our great in-person uh, resources. Uh, digitization creates new records that meet, need uh, pretty active management. Um, the paper trail collection is 100% digital, so um, and it's in the holdings of UBC Library Rare Books and Special Collections, where um, its files are digitally preserved over the long term and actively managed against file corruption or obsolescence. So you can see uh, once you um, navigate and drill into the digital object, uh, what what that kind of looks like the, your preservation copy and your access copy. So two common issues, <clears throat> uh, two of the more common issues when it comes to digital file management, uh, the first is file naming conventions. Digital files need to be named and organized for navigation and retrieval. If you Google File naming conventions, the majority of resources are produced by academic universities because they have such big research projects and teams that generate research data versions um, over and over. And the resource um, that I will be circulating is from UBC Library with guidelines on file naming and also directory structure. Um, and this is, um, this is kind of based on the concept of like, you know, taking into consideration what can and cannot be read by a machine, what can and cannot be read by a human, and then uh, the default sorting that uh, is, um, well, default. So uh, briefly, think through the types of files you'll be creating in your project and determine a file naming convention based on how you expect to retrieve files. And then uh, most importantly is to be consistent in applying it. So here, uh, when we are doing the scanning, this is the file naming convention that uh, has been set up. Um, basically my goal is to keep, us, keep the front and back scans together. So you can see how that might sort with the one and the two. Um, and uh, any convention that you create for your project, uh, please, uh, you'll need to document in a readme file that explains how to follow it and uh, what it means. And I know many people are downloading digital files uh, from different uh, resources that are available online. 
And so pay attention to what string it uh, is automatically included. The first bullet is, uh, is, a, um, is a file that is downloaded from the paper trail. So the stuff at the front is um, machine language, but at the tail end, that's the unique identifier that identifies the uh, repository, uh, UBC Rare Books and Special Collections, the collection number, ARC 1838, and then the um, item number, which is DO, which stands for digital object, and numerically number 228, and R for the recto, meaning the front of the certificate. Um, the second bullet is from Library and Archives Canada that identifies the reel, the reel number, and the image number on that reel. So this is so that you can go back and find it if you need. And that last one is really just off my camera and needs um, has no discernible information that we can um, use other than it's a image. The other big issue um, for digital file management is uh, storage and backup. So digital preservation uses the principle of redundancy and diversity. So make many copies, which is typically three, and store them in different places and on different media. So your working copy counts as one. Um, the cloud or Google Drive counts as one. Note that uh, we have a here, near, and far. And what is considered far? Some people, because of uh, the prevalence of nat natural disasters, uh, define far as a different time zone. And you want these on two different, when it specifies two different media, that means don't just buy a CD pack of five CDs and think that that's five different copies. Uh, put them on different media formats, so CD and and a external hard drive. And, uh, or if it is CD, at least at minimum, make sure that they are different brands in case, you know, there's some recall. Okay. Project management. Um, digitization costs money. Archival supplies are expensive. It takes time and it takes uh, human resources. And there I actually gave you a friend or family member to help you in your tasks, but sometimes you might, you know, you might actually be the only one doing this work. So in archives, we apply project management principles to plan and define a project scope with, within an achievable time and budget. Is your goal to digitize a very special album of photos, for example? Is it to create a family history for an upcoming reunion or celebration of life? And of course, digitization is only one part of a family history project. Chinese Canadian records are scattered and they're sparse. So um, there is the need to often collect and create new records to fill these gaps, usually by oral history. And this, these are some examples of self-published self family history projects at the uh, TPL Chinese Canadian Archive. Um, Ellen Joe's memoir of immigrating to Canada as a paper son uh, is one of them. And that's because a uh, paper son, you know, what are the record, how do you show that a person is a paper son through their records? You can't, it's, uh, you have to have like their testimonial. In the middle, the by Mei Yi, um, her and her siblings' experience uh, is captured um, from being ethnic Chinese Vietnamese uh, boat people. And uh, we know that people who are fleeing conflict really don't have many records. And these are the testimonials of the different family members that she compiled. And the way family history is like a classic uh, genealogy kind of book um, documenting 2,500 known descendants of the Wei surname in the diaspora. <clears throat> so the Antiques Roadshow has been running on the BBC since the late 1970s. So that's getting on to be 50 years, right? Um, in the show, people bring in their belongings to be evaluated by a professional appraiser who provides an in-depth historical, 
context or artistic or craft context to the item and an approximate valuation. Knowing the context of the item contributes to its value and items of value are worthy of preservation. And so in long-term preservation, this context needs preserving as intellectual understanding of an item across time and what we call enduring value. And so the paper trail has been a kind of antiques roadshow, right? Themed around the Chinese Exclusion Act. People bring in their CDI certificates and Catherine and the paper trail, paper trail team provide that historical context that individuals need to understand and value the CI certificates within their family records. Uh, the paper trail actually goes one step further. It sends people back into their families to delve into the emotional value, the empathy of these records, which is being increasingly recognized as a value of records, the emotional value. You know, who was this ancestor and what was life like for them? Um, and so as an archivist with research interest in this area, the two questions I might ask to try to um, quantify and, and bring this emotional value uh, forward is something like, um, you know, do the records help you know, remember, and or otherwise maintain connection to a person, to a place, event, time, or experience of importance to you? Do the records help you understand who you are and your place in the world? And if the answer is yes to either or both of these, then um, it turns out that these records, your family records, might not be, be of importance to others in the family because of family relationships. Uh, my parents and grandparents were all immigrants, so uh, we have very few family records, at least that I know of. But we have cultural traditions which make up the broader field of heritage and its inclusion of both tangible and intangible forms. And heritage recognizes the meaning that we assign and actively create in the personal, for example, daily rituals in the community, uh, our, dis, our um, commemoration of the Exclusion Act as a community, for example, and in cultural traditions. And one of my favorite festivals coming up is the Qingming Festival, which happens every year around Easter. And this is a festival devoted to reflecting on those who have passed. Different rituals are observed within families to keep memories of ancestors alive, most commonly by visiting and tending to their graves. So sometimes it's called uh, the Tomb Sweeping Festival. And I know the Chinese Canadian Museum has an annual, has a talk um, on the subject coming up, so I'll keep it brief. Um, the Qingming Festival has historical significance in the diaspora. Early Chinese in Canada were here without their families, and the festival rites had to be performed for them by members of their clan association. So here are observance at Mountain View Cemetery in Vancouver in the early 1900s. And the heritage of the festival has continued to the present day. Here, my Chinatown Clan Association is continuing the tradition at the community level at the Chinese altar at Mountain View Cemetery. And this altar is maintained by the Chinese Benevolent Association and its member organizations. And the poem that's being read, uh, the edict, recognizes the hardships and sacrifices of the early overseas Chinese as our collective ancestors. And here is my personal family practice of Qingming at Ocean View Cemetery in Burnaby at my grandparents' graves. And these are people that I know as Ye Ye and Yin Yin, which follow the uh, tradition of um, using the complex but precise and deeply personal Chinese kinship terms uh, that uh, many of us know our ancestors by or grew up knowing them by. So something, um, I think, uh, you know, two ways to honor and remember your ancestors now that you found their paper trail um, is to try to refer to them again by their Chinese kinship term, right? Um, these are things that are being lost uh, in addition to Chinese language, Cantonese language. 
uh, but the denote a very personal and unique relationship uh, that one has with their ancestors. It's the difference between calling somebody um, ye ye and ngin ngin from gong gong and po po. Uh, likely in your paper trail, you have located cemetery records and you can see where there is rich genealogical information on their um, on these grave site gravestones, and so that uh, it can maybe help you um, have a Qingming tradition or create one or recover one in this year that of refinding our um, ancestors and honoring them. Uh, Chinese Canadian heritage. So I'm, I'm actually going to pause here because it is on my grandparents. Um, Chinese Canadian heritage, uh, including archives, have been challenging to pass down for two reasons. The first reason is racism. And the second is internalized racism. It's uh, what we call uh, stinky ethnic lunch syndrome or speak English syndrome, right? It has taken about a hundred years for us to move from being allowed to be Chinese in Canada to being proud to be Chinese in Canada. For a head tax certificate to transform from being a hated and despised record to a marker of belonging and proudly displayed. And uh, so displaying and sharing records that have value to you and taking better care of them through preservation uh, that signals to others in your family that these records matter. And we refer to preservation as acts of archival care. This includes preparing records for the transfer of this care when we are no longer able to provide it within our lifetime. And preparing your records is increasingly important to do because of this. Uh, a great junk transfer is here and things are being thrown out because they look like junk. Um, so if you preserve your paper trail properly, it has a better chance of surviving this transfer. I see room for improvement in preservation is in the context of records, especially uh, photographs, which are so common in our family archives, right? Doing how great it is, how great is it when you find that someone in the family uh, find out that they took the time to do this, right? Wrote the particulars of a photo on the back of it. When you name a digital file with a good description so that others can understand what it is. And here is the ubiquitous banker's box. Uh, I don't like these, full stop. I don't like these, they're too big. Things flop around inside without any proper support and they become overfilled and heavy. They end up in the basement and stacked on the floor, which are two uh, don'ts that I mentioned. Uh, they are preservation risks. These are not designed for or suitable for long-term preservation. Uh, when things are placed in bankers' boxes or moved around for storage purposes from you know, one room to another or to a garage, it's probably time to think about their transfer to someone else in the family or to an archives. Um, when we were doing scanning over the pandemic, one gentleman my age showed up at my house with a banker's box that he had just picked up from his mom's house. He came directly en route, picked it up, came to my house, um, and this was to undertake uh, scanning of CI certificates in his family. And it turns out that his mother had been the keeper of the family's paper trail and had prepared it for the day that he would express interest. And so he was able to just, and so she was able to just hand it over at that exact moment. And that's what those handles on that box are for. It's for transferring records. And it always um, stuck with me uh, seeing this because it was so manageable for him to start to go through this box of uh, family records literally on the hood of his car.
So his certificates and many of yours and your family stories are now preserved in the Paper Trail Collection at UBC Library, Rare Books and Special Collections. And this is an amazing preservation feat for our community where it has truly uh, taken a village. The project has a very focused area of collecting of uh, collecting, sorry, the project has a very focused area of collecting on CI certificates. And collections policy and collection mandates will be something that you need to research if you're interested in donating your records to an archive. Uh, but uh, a couple of tips for this is stick with the local area where the history matters most. Uh, keep records in good condition, keep practice and care for them. And uh, ask questions. What is your collecting mandate? Does it include Chinese Canadians? My ancestor or family was X, Y, Z. And of course, you can always consult an archivist. Hmm, my presentation was shorter than I thought it would be. <laughs> hey, thank you, June, for that amazing and insightful talk. Uh, it brings up a lot of questions that I've always had as well, which we were chatting about earlier on preservation. Like, um, I, I run into that problem a lot with you know, we never label any of our photos or family photos. And I'll be looking back and you kind of try and date it by, you know, how old like a baby looks in there, but you never, like, it doesn't help sometimes. <laughs> it's like any age range in there. Uh, okay, so we'll move into the question and answer portion of this webinar now. Uh, there have been a few questions posed already um, and a few themes that we've kind of identified. So one of the questions that a few people have asked now are, what are your recommended methods to remove adhesive from photos that were in old magnetic or adhesive albums? And do you recommend the floss, using floss to like dental floss um, to remove photos from magnetic albums? Um, well, yeah, great. Let's get into the sticky albums <laughs> straight off because they're such a problem. They're everywhere. Um, so there's two ways to think about it. Um, the damage the damage has already been done in the sense that there's like residue uh, on your photos, but they are not necessarily actively damaging uh, the item any longer. Uh, so, you know, you'll find that things have, uh, like the tackiness, sometimes the photo has, uh, the, the adhesive is worn out, and so your photos will fall out uh, naturally, and then you have to kind of figure out how to put them back in. But um, once that backing has been exposed, it is adhesive, and you want to, uh, again, what I mentioned was isolating it, so uh, not uh, contaminating um, other materials with that residue. Uh, if they're still stuck in there, they might be just happy. You might be happy to just leave them. Um, I've never heard of a floss technique. Uh, if when the glue, the glue, so, you know, the adhesive can also be very gummy, have uh, increased and become very gummy so that you can't take photos out safely anymore without risk to tearing them. And so you really have to decide, you know, uh, do I need to actually remove the photo and for what purpose? Uh, because that will require uh, chemicals to treat the adhesive in order for it to um, unbind safely. And that would be uh, conservation, something that you would take to a conservator. Uh, otherwise, you know, you can uh, scan and access the photo while it is still in the album. Uh, but the point is to stop using those things. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's another question about labeling and storage. What do you recommend as the safest method for labeling photos or other documents? And do you have recommended methods for what to store um, photo albums and such objects in? <clears throat> 
Is it because I said don't I don't like bankers boxes? Maybe. <laughs> is that why is that why? Um sorry, can you repeat the question? Uh so that was a bit of a two-part question. So mm -hmm. um let's just go with the, the second one that I asked. What are your recommended methods or preference for containers of storing photo albums in? Like, do you recommend using plastic bins or does it really depend on the size of, you know, like your collection of albums and such? Uh, I mean, this is, this is uh, again, an indication of if you start to think about like a, the banker's box is like a storage Kind of it it indicates um, things that are moving from being an active record, meaning you often reference it or use it, um, and it's like moving into uh, being inactive and where you don't need it anymore. So that's when a tendency to put things in in bigger boxes uh, it, for, for storage purposes or for moving purposes. Um, normally, albums like sit on a person's shelf right, uh, and are uh, easily accessed and hopefully, you know, uh, accessed once in a while to flip through and, um, uh, and used. Um, it's when things become uh, not actively used or have um, use has kind of passed that, that things uh, need to be kind of thought about in that way. Um, I find, you know, if you have photos, uh, a photo box is perfectly sufficient. Um, if you think about, you know, um, a smaller container or box that you you can put things in and actually uh, physically put it on, put it on a shelf, right? Rather than on the floor, something big and bulky that you would put on the floor. Uh, a lot of people love making these, uh, using their photos to put into an album. Uh, it's just, you know, what do you use if it's, uh, and some of it is aesthetic, you know, uh, people created the, that old timey album, you know, was a lot of love and care and creativity in selecting photos, in placing them and mounting them. And uh, so if that's something that um, you want to do for, for the family members, um, and that's something uh, or else, you know, if they're just in in plastic sleeves and in a binder is is uh, sometimes sufficient as well. Yeah. Like, what are you trying? What are you trying to go for? What's what's your intention? Thank you. There's another question leading off that about labeling. So what do you recommend is the safest method for labeling or adding detailed information about photos or other material objects, belongings? Uh, the one that the example that I showed in the slide deck was really just, you know, turn over the photo and write it on pen, write it with a pen. Uh, within an archive, we're, we're only allowed to use pencil, but you could do, uh, you know, what makes sense in your family. Um, this is why I prefer the analog and paper-based records because there is a uh, front and a back, you know, that are kept together. So with a photograph, we're talking about, um, you know, context and, and, you know, sometimes you call it metadata that can be written directly on the back of the photo. And as long as the photo is accessible from both sides, you can actually access both simultaneously. It's in digital records where things start to fall off and you have to um, have more cumbersome documentation, sometimes in the format of a spreadsheet, which are not um, particularly fun to look at. And they're not, they've, they're not as personal. So if you um, have photographs uh, and uh, physical photographs, you know, those are, um, yeah, really, really good to uh, preserve and seem to be of high value within families, right? And I would guess that this um, approach, like writing in pencil on the back of a photograph, the whatever information that you want to capture in that, um, when you're displaying photos in a photo album where you don't necessarily see the back of it, uh, do you recommend any, recommend any alternative ways of like displaying that information or 
does that approach change at all? Um, it's really, yeah, just, um, you know, what, you know, these are very um, personal, personal projects in creating albums. Uh, the importance is to have that context available somewhere. And the, um, that, that old timey album that I, um, that I included as an example, again, it allows the back to be the back of the photograph to be uh, accessed. Uh, nothing's worse than something stuck in a um, sticky album. And you you wonder if there's something written on the back. So that's why um, I shared the cumbersomely shared that that uh, DIY process of making a corner if you're going to mount it on paper, um, or you can buy photo sleeves um, and only yeah photo sleeves can slip in and out. And again, it's the access to the back of uh, the photograph that seems to that uh, is the goal. Uh, you can't write on the back of photos with pencil. So just go ahead and do it in pen. It's fine. Okay. Um, when you're, so going back a bit to recommended methods of re removing adhesive from photos, do you recommend using um, like rubbing alcohol or acetone to remove those adhesives? Is that damaging? Yeah, unless really, unless the unless um, yeah, again, we are tr we are uh, don't feel that you have to like reverse damage that's been done, but via tape or by adhesive. Um, what you want to do is just isolate it and prevent it from spreading to other documents. Um, those. Uh, treating adhesive for whatever purpose really is a conservation treatment uh, because it does involve chemicals. So um, I'm an art, I'm not trained in that area. I just know that that is a situation where you would want to um, not create further damage by using the wrong technique. Yeah, and maybe we can, um, I see that in the chat, um, Jean Lee has passed along a list of conservators. So yes. I'll put that in um, in the Q&A, mm -hmm. like answered one, so that people can refer to that for any questions about how to care for these um, documents and without damaging them or restoration questions. And um, there's another question about kind of specifics a bit about conservation, but um, it's about how to capture photos in glass frames where the photos are stuck on the glass so, or not even always just stuck on the glass, photos that are in glass frames. Do you recommend if they're not stuck to the glass, taking them out to scan them, especially if these are fragile photos that are, you know, 100 or so years old, would taking them out accelerate oxidization due to being so brittle? Um, like, would you just scan them and then put them back in a glass frame? Do you recommend using glass frames generally? <laughs> um, and yeah, best photos to best practice to capture these photos like that are in glass. Wow, that's a very specific question. Um, I think some of the scanners that we have these days uh, actually account for all the um, different um, lighting situations or can to compensate. Uh, certainly we have had, or, or I have had to scan um, items within that are still in, in their frame uh, because that is what the donor specified, that this is very precious. I don't want it inadvertently becoming damaged if taking it in and out of the frame, scan it in the frame. And so that is perfectly achievable with some of the high quality scanners that are out there. Um, and then I guess, uh, I guess th that'll be somebody else's problem down the road if they need. <laughs> we defer a lot of these things to the next, the next generation, don't we? always passing it down. 
another question that's about kind of, you know, sharing this burden of uh, preserving documents. So I kind of want to read this comment just because it was a very nice one towards you, June, but um, the comment is, June, I believe that your work as an archivist is of immense value to your communities, which it definitely is. Uh, archivists are kind of like public servants or nurses for objects of value and meaning. Helping preserve records is invaluable. For a young person who is interested in this journey as a career path, do you have any recommendations for them? Or any advice that you would give, um, and things that you were, you know, glad you did or regret not doing um, during your archival training. Great question, and also please contact me on LinkedIn to have a more in-depth, off off the record, <laughs> off the record discussion. Um, I was very fortunate to um, enter archival studies with, uh, after having a very strong community practice and heritage practice in Vancouver's Chinatown. So that uh, definitely, you know, helped me set what I want to do and the things, the needs that I was seeing in my community. And that informed uh, the professional practices, the, the kind of internships and uh placements in community uh, or, or within that, you know, um, involved Chinese Canadian records and across a lot of different um, environments. Because you'll see, so I was, you know, at the church archives and I was at the UBC Library Rare Books and Special Collections. I was at Library and Archives Canada, you know, um, I was at the Paper Trail. And so this diversity of, of experience, but always working with Chinese Canadian records in these different institutional and community contexts uh, is really helpful because you can see how, how standards, uh, archival standards and archival practices need to be really adapted to a cultural community. So Chinese Canadian records are very special. Um, cultural community, the records of any cultural community are, are unique and they um, may or may not fit into these like very rigid professional standards that are set within a profession that has um, traditionally not have not had very much room for uh, cultural records. Um, so that to me, uh, I think has been really uh, helpful that that diversity of experience across different um, platforms of practicing Chinese Canadian archives now that I am in a Chinese Canadian archive doing that work, uh, seeing, you know, being able to draw on, on how standards have been applied in a lot of different uh, contexts. And uh, again, this, this uh, adaptation that we need to do. I think we have time for one last question. Um, I thought this one might be interesting to be asked live. So do you have any suggestions pr for preserving oral tradition and language, especially as Cantonese is considered a dying language? Yeah, speak it. Learn it and speak it or speak what you know. I had that slide about just calling your ancestors by, you know, the Chinese kinship term. Um, What was the actual front end of that question? How to preserve it or how to? Yeah, do you have any suggestions for preserving oral tradition and language? Yeah, you have to practice it. A lot of these heritage practices are, are cultural traditions or practices and they generate, uh, they regenerate and generate themselves through actually doing it. So the Qingming celebration, the Qingming festival that has to be practiced every year in order for it to regenerate and for um because it's a family tradition across generations you have to like reinforce that every year through the doing of it there's a certain like muscle memory uh that you get you know when you make offerings to your ancestors you know how to hold incense how to bow how to you know uh, uh create those um ingots out of the joss paper, you know, where to, how to go shopping for these things. These are all, um, you know, daily practices and heritage practices that you can only do 
uh, spend time and uh, do with your, you know, physical being by being present and by uh, you, you are the record. Um, and that gets into some really interesting ways of thinking about a record is how do you actually record? Uh, I, I know that a lot of videos and, and things are being uh, done to record these practices, but, you know, you have to think about the person uh, doing doing the thing, doing the heritage, the cultural practice as as a recorder as well. Thank you. So we had a pretty lively Q and A, and we weren't able to get to all of the questions that were asked. So if your question was not answered, um, I believe is the best method to contact you, June, by email or by your LinkedIn. Um, if you have LinkedIn, that's great. Um, if not, is my email floating around? Yeah, I'll be included in um, the follow-up yeah. email to all participants to, yeah. to junemchow at gmail.com. So we'll, we will be emailing a recording of this webinar, um, as well as a further learning resource um, handout that June is putting together. Uh, that will probably be ready to go out by Wednesday, so just in a couple of days. And they will be made available on the Chinese Canadian Museum website under the program page for this webinar. And the recording will be on our YouTube channel as well. So I just wanted to push a little bit of um, future programming. So um, in the spirit of kind of preservation and honoring our ancestors' memories, uh, the Qingming Festival is on April 4th this year. And the Chinese Canadian Museum will have some special talks and tours um, for this, which the details will be posted on our website in the coming week. But tentatively, um, there will be a talk and tour of the Mountain View Cemetery, where many um, Chinese Canadians are, are buried on April 14th. And then in Victoria, there will be a talk and tour um, of Harling Point on April 7th. So lastly, if you have yet to visit our feature exhibition, The Paper Trail to the 1923 Chinese Exclusion Act, curated by Catherine Clement, um, please visit us in Vancouver Chinatown at 51 East Pender Street. And for anyone wishing um, to explore further resources and have some assistance in uncovering the family's paper trail, you can always stop by our research room where Naomi holds office hours on Saturdays from 1 to 5 p.m. And you can also email her, email her to book an appointment. So thank you all for attending today and we hope to see you at future programs. Thank Bye you all. and good luck everyone with your preservation projects. You're gonna get questions. <laughs> Take care. Thank you.